When you think of Renoir, you might think of Nana from the silent era. La Grande Illusion, or the rules of the game, when talkies became the norm. But for many, like Martin Scorsese, what comes to mind is the visual beauty of the river, Renoir's 1951 film that saw the director dive headfirst into Technicolor for the first time. I would say um, this and The Red Shoes are the two most beautiful color films ever made. This coming of age tale, shot entirely in Bengal, India, and based on Rumor Gordon's novel, dealt with themes of love, adolescence, and death, as it followed the intersecting lives of three young girls with the never-ending flow of the Ganges River serving as the backdrop. It is the story of my first love, about growing up on the banks of a wide river. First love must be the same any place, and it might have been in America, England, New Zealand, or Timbuktu, though they do not, of course, have rivers in Timbuktu. But the flavor of my story would have been different in each, and the flavor of the people who lived by the river would have been different. Young teenager Harriet is the eldest of six siblings, whose home is frequented by her slightly older friend Valerie. Melanie, meanwhile, is the mixed-race daughter of the widowed English doctor next door and has just returned from schooling. When Captain John, a handsome American soldier with an amputated leg, enters their cross-cultural world, the three girls contend with the first pangs of young love, and it sometimes puts them at odds with each other. The film has a distinctively female perspective, one that might not have been achieved had Renoir not demanded Godin's involvement. As he says in his autobiography, My Life and My Films, Renoir stipulated to producer and financial backer Kenneth McEldowney, I should write the script in collaboration with the author of the novel. The River is a pretty faithful adaptation of Godin's novel of the same name, which was inspired by her own privileged childhood growing up in the town of Narayanganj. Disappointed with the 1947 adaptation of Black Narcissus, Godin had made a rule to never sell the film rights to any of her novels ever again, but she broke it for Renoir. Before he approached me, he, Jean Renoir, had gone to Bengal to find our old house and had even slept the night in our nursery. Impressed with the director's vision and commitment, Godin not only agreed to let him make the film, but also accepted his invitation to write the script. Renoir wanted to add new characters and ensure they reflected the truth of Godin's childhood. Who better to write them and the film's new dialogue than Godin herself? In my life and my films, Renoir recalls his time on set with the author. Rumor Godin sat in one room, digesting piece by piece the new elements introduced to the story and rendering them in her own elegant language. She also trained the youngsters playing the Georgians' parts. The results were excellent. Godin also recalled in her autobiography her experience working with the director. Jean knew the river even more deeply than I, yet, as we worked, he would wait for minutes, half an hour, perhaps an hour while I searched for a word. Though we kept what we could of the original dialogue, there had to be more. Also, as usual, I needed time to know the new characters, how they would speak, sound, originate. Melanie was one of the new additions to the story, with Indian dancer Radha playing the role in a refreshing move to present an Indian character who isn't in a servile position to the English expats. Her creation also reinforces the cross-cultural existence of this community, where Western and Eastern sensibilities inform the young girl's attitudes, as well as present an intersectional female perspective of romance and womanhood too. Unlike Harriet and Valerie, there is a reservedness in her affection for the captain. Wouldn't you rather marry an American? I don't understand them. Her parentage means she is too English for an Indian marriage because of her castless status. Suppose I like to be nowhere. But also, in the subtext, the racial politics of the era are at play. She is too Indian, too exotic, to consider herself a suitable choice for an American suitor. It is not you I dislike. Who is it? Myself. Struggling with her own identity, Melanie doesn't give herself the luxury of openly pining for a man. She's hesitant, she's lost, she feels like an outsider. That's why she and John have a small moment of connection. 
He's lost and his disability makes him feel like an outsider too. Someday I shall find out where I belong. Valerie and Harriet, on the other hand, are far more ardent with their affections and it causes a rivalry between the girls. We've all been there, right? Right? Harry, gently, gently. Harriet has an idealized vision of love influenced by the culture she has been embedded in. In one gorgeous, yet somewhat orientalist scene, she regales the captain and Valerie with a Hindu love story that Renoir visualizes in a vibrant, dreamlike sequence with a dance number, featuring Melanie personified as the female protagonist of Harriet's tale. Harriet's hopes are pinned on the captain, but they're unrequited. Her more womanly best friend Valerie has caught his attention, leaving the younger teen to watch their romance develop from the sidelines. Renoir depicts her gaze of longing through frequent shots of Harriet watching the couple, whether it's through windows or bars, there's a keen sense that the young girl is confined by her adolescence as she watches her friend, free to embrace womanhood, that Harriet is in such a rush to enter. The innocence of all three girls' sexual awakening is no better presented than through a slow-paced chase sequence involving the four romantically linked characters in the forested area of Harriet's family estate. John is following Melanie, Harriet is spying on John, while Valerie is sneakily following them all. It's that gaze again, but framed in a different way. The aggressiveness of Valerie's desire pays off when she reconciles with the soldier by the riverbank, handing him a symbolic bouquet of flowers with Melanie and Harriet looking on. The pair kiss, but no shade to Captain John, it was a disappointment for all the women involved. Valerie gave her flowers away too early to a man she liked the idea of more than the reality. The chase is what excited her more than the prize. It was like something in a dream. Now you've made it real. Melanie had already made peace with the lack of romantic future with John, but for Harriet, oh, it was a tough blow. The kiss on her lips, terrifying and fascinating, burned into my heart and hurt. It was my first kiss, but received by another. I couldn't bear it. Here Godin's writing perfectly articulates the truth and pain that comes with a first broken heart. Harriet has once again become a spectator of the romance she has created in her own mind, and that kiss is the nail in the coffin of her unrequited affections. The heartache is palpable. That kiss symbolizes the destruction of youthful fantasies of love and desire. It wakes them up from the stupor of their varying infatuations and brings them back to the harsh realities of life filled with broken hearts and family deaths. Harriet doesn't want to grow up anymore. But that destructive force also clears the way for an adult rebirth into womanhood and better understanding. When I was Harriet's age, it was Byron. Then it was Valentino, I think. And then I fell in love with the milkman. It ends with the mending of the feminine bond between these young women. Life goes on by the river. The cycle of life, love and death continues as these girls who themselves have their own monthly river to contend with, make the most of the present. Ten minutes ago she wasn't born, and tomorrow we'll be used to her. And yesterday we... Bother yesterday. This is today. And today. Here is the baby. The baby and us. The big river. The whole world and everything. Renoir certainly could not have achieved the veracity of these female perspectives had he not sought collaboration with Godin. Sure, hers is that of an upper middle class white woman, but there's an authenticity to her experience that this film is at pains to replicate. Thanks to her textual influence and his dynamic, aesthetically driven storytelling, The River stands out as a blossoming coming of age story for the ages with a much appreciated female vantage point. Girls, you gotta love them.